right, so we'll start. So good evening. Welcome to MSD at Home with Alison Crank and Rafael Panaza, co-founder of Tiger Tiger in conjunction with the A Visiting School Melbourne. The lecture's title tonight is How to Fail Properly 101, followed by a Q&A session. So my name is Paul Lowe. I'm a senior lecturer in digital architecture design here at the Melbourne School of Design, University of Melbourne. I begin this evening proceeding by acknowledging the traditional owner of the land on which these events took place in Melbourne, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Korean nations. And to the traditional owner of the land, wherever you are, I pay respect to the elders, family, past and present. So this is the fifth year of the Mel that Melbourne School of Design has hosted the Architecture Association's visiting school at the Melbourne School of Design. Now each year we invited a group of AA tutors, both past and present, alumni and talented designers that's affiliated with the AA school to teach a two weeks intensive design studio here at the MSD. The visiting school provides an experimental platform in which staff and students can test new and emerging design methods, technology, techniques. And this year, we also extend this experimental mentality towards a different way of teaching online. This is the third year of the new paper agenda directed by Mon Q, whom I will invite to speak shortly and to introduce our speakers tonight. We have five online studios running this year with all the tutors based in Europe and the UK. All our students have also joined us online, so welcome. The agendas of, this studio, of, the, of the studios vary, ranging from Alison's and Raphael's studios on the fourth place to explore the, and to the explorations of behavior of an emerging race of domestic animal caused by the current global pandemic. So Mon, over to you. Thank you, Paul. It's with great privilege that I invite two of my great friends here tonight to present at the MSD at Home and the first kickoff lecture for the AA Visiting School Melbourne. Alison Crank is the co-founder of Tiger Tiger. She explores the intersection of art, technology, and architecture for public and commercial spaces. She's currently also the head of digital experiences at WOW and at XR Studio, and was previously a design researcher at the EPFL Lab, leading a two-year research project on immersive digital experiences for public spaces. She has worked with the likes of Omega, Cartier, and Swiss Airlines, just to name a few, with an interactive XR experiences. The other half of Tiger Tiger is Raphael Paneza, an IMDB and award-winning creative producer with affiliations to Atlas V, Albion, and Fawn Studio. Raphael has worked in the video games industry for Ubisoft and the film industry on Fragments of Antoine and Alone. Over the past 20 years, Raphael has directed, produced, and edited some of the most interesting VR storytelling narratives that weaves together pop culture, films, and new media. I have spent many nights on differing digital platforms discussing the future of architecture and how XR experiences, films, will shape the way we live in the future with both these experts. And I hope tonight that they'll impart their stories with you. So without further ado, here is Tiger Tiger. To you, Alison and Raphael. Thank you, Amon. Thank you for having us. Um, I will just share my screen. Hi, all. Uh, welcome to the How to Fail Properly 101. Uh, I'm Raphael and uh, I'm with Alison. Um, we all know how to fail uh, correctly. I hope I will succeed with that one because succeeding in failure is always a pleasure. Um, we are failing since, since the really beginning. Um, uh, for example, when you are four and you are um, trying to crack the gravity laws, um, uh, ignoring the, your parents' uh, advertising, breaking some bones and keeping a scar for life. But it's okay. You can do it as an adult age. Um, sometimes it's just in the detail and you provide that feeling of failure constantly. Uh, sometimes it's back in the past and you forget. So we, un we have to provide uh, some good memories of it uh, because it's always an improvement. Um, sometimes it's in front of everyone. Um, you have this feeling not to, to be failure right now, but you, you can continue. And yes, 
you're so right. Uh, the pin code of a kidney is zero, zero, zero. Because failure is always a pleasure. Um, if it's not for you, it will be for someone else. So you need to, to continue. You need to push the boundaries. And if it's not for someone else, it will be for you. You will, be, you will provide to the humanity a, a good book about um, success, failures, with a weird cover, always. Um, but to, to, to fail um, correctly, you need to be creative. And to be creative, you need to have good visual. You need the big ambitions and you need good design. Um, for example, we need, all of us, we need a cooler that can mix um, head speaker and eyes. What could be wrong between electricity and beers? Uh, nothing. We all want that. And sometimes we are feeling just in the, um, in the writing, but who cares? You, you need to push that and you need to succeed in the failure. Never forget that uh, it's, you are never too big to fail um, correctly. Uh, you can do it socially, economically. Um, you can do it in your own business. And even when you have a failure, you can push it again, far uh, further and further. And this is one of my favorites because failure has no limit, only use. So if you want to provide art to the world, go for it. This is my favorite spanakrist ever. But we need to fail properly. So it's always something that you need to provide to the world. First thing, never forget that your idea is original. It's the good one. You are the only one to have it. You are the only one who can provide it to the world. Um, you need to push it. You need to go um, higher than anyone. Because who knows? Uh, if someone had it before you, it will not as great as yours. Sometimes it's just a detail um, you want to push. You have the great concept, you don't know nothing around it, but you will find the good people to, uh, to help you uh, to push that limit. Um, the idea is everything. Yeah, you need to be original. And you can adapt yourself, but don't let people adapt you. Um, you are the only one who can carry that. For example, uh, you, have, you, have, you have the best idea for a short film, you are 15, you want to 12 hosts, and at the end there is three injuries, no camera and no movies. No matter what, you have this bi big idea to do the Lord of the Ring um, 30 years before the, the real one. So don't hide. Scream to the world that you can, um, you can succeed, that you can provide a big, big idea, original one, uh, even if you, you don't know how to do it. Brand yourself. Always. Mm -hmm. And hire talented people for specific tasks. Uh, it's really important. Even if, for example, you are um, managing a studio with 40 people, you have an head of R&D, um, no more IT. And you need to provide computers. Um, you need to provide uh, softwares. But you will, hide, um, you will ask the uh, head of R&D to, to fix the computer graphic card. And sometimes it's good to have someone that can answer you um, your best question because you are the guy in charge. Never forget that the value of your idea is measured by money. Um, more is better, always. You need nothing else. If your idea is original, Someone will put money in it and will, will follow you until the end, um, until you achieve something. Sometimes it can be bigger and bigger. I remember that if I've, after one year and still raising money, it's that the, the original idea is the good one. If it's not on a product, you can do it on digital, like video games, like app like a real big new promise um, for the next year. Whatever the time, whatever the money, you know that the value is on, on the trust that people um, can give you. And money is trust. But just remember that you don't make money with philosophy. Never. It's, it's the, the core is the original idea, 
because people will follow you on that. It's not, oops, it's not because um, you are living in the streets, uh, surrounded by dogs, um, screaming after the, the corrupted people managing the city that you will have, you will earn any money or, uh, or even mark the history. Six, technology needs to be sexy, really. Without that, what's the point? The idea is original, people put money on it. You won't act like them. Just remember that your products uh, will be wear by people every day. Um, and you want them to, uh, to wear it with, with proud at any moment of the day, even if it's uh, for a Sunday polo session with friend. Oh, and that one is the Jewel. This is the Biosan 5. And so this is a, uh, I, I know the designer personally of this is a Danish Bang & Olufsen uh, UX whole uh, sound system. Um, and the idea, it's all about the idea. And the idea is that you have to put your hand in deeper to get deeper into the music. And it's a really nice, sexy design, so much so that you don't even see which one of the three different rings you can barely distinguish which is the exterior what is the outterior and um my anecdote for this is uh, i worked with a designer we had him selling uh, at a, a design store and we bought this uh this expensive device to have there um i asked the designer we couldn't figure out how to play a song on this platform it costs a lot of money so we just couldn't figure it out because the gestures made absolutely no sense um and the screen was everything was it wasn't touch screen. You had to use this weird device that was like super overly designed. So I asked the designer, can you just choose the song on the playlist? And he looked at it and he goes, I have no idea how this works. And it was mind blowing because uh, he designed and built the gestures and the interface, but yet he had absolutely no uh, idea of how the technology works or even just what those gestures of moving these dials and buttons that he had put on there do and it was we, we actually couldn't get the music to play so in the end we just unplugged the jack and we put it into a phone and you know played it directly from our phone but it was just mind-blowing that the designer behind this his intention and in going into it and even with working with Bang & Olufsen which is a very famous brand never even thought about you know, how does this actually work? Or if you're designing this to be a sexy object, maybe it should be something functional or maybe it should work with that. No, um, but absolutely not. No, for him, it was because just more that it looked nice and it was the nice gesture. <laughs> and the idea is original. It was well paid and it was a nice product. Because eye concept is always better than content. You want, whoops, for example. Well, Everyone likes bacon. Everyone likes the smell of bacon in the morning. You like to eat bacon. You can have bacon for breakfast. You can have bacon at dinner. So why not floss with bacon? And fortunately, someone had this brilliant idea. It's always better to have an eye concept. Like, why not um, propulsive car, SUV for two people for small cities? And uh, there is another. Oh, no, that one is a good one. And I don't know what is wrong with concept cars, but we know that we need that car in in small city in France. Uh, we know that we need that car in the bush in Australia because you never know when you need to leave uh, to go to Sydney or if you need to go to Beijing or even me if I want to travel to Paris or, or Dublin. It's perfect. You can park it everywhere. It's original. It's good and costs a little bit of money. So when you have a good idea, an original one and someone put money in it, ne never let it go. It's yours, only yours. For example, when you, you, you can fight with the world to keep your, your own metric system because this is a good value. And let the pros talk, always. You are paying them for that. If they are doing misbehavior, if they are wrong, it's their fault, not yours. In any case, you are paying them, you voted for them, it's okay. And there is always citizen that can take care of um, or regular issue, um, civil issue or even original issue. And yeah, it is one of the greatest for us, um, Elizabeth Holmes. 
she was brilliant. No one was listening to the um, to the original concept. She knew everything. Her professors, when she asked them if it was possible, and said no, she stuck she stuck to her ideas, and she was like, no, I know better than you, um, and I'll just drop my voice down an octave so that I sound like I know better than you. Um, but she never let it go. Never. Let it go. And remember that innovation is always better than adoption. For example, audience never adopt the sensor Roma, but what an opportunity to leave something fully uh, at the really beginning um, in, in the 60s. It was amazing. Um, the try again, because we want to smell the trash, we want to smell the feet, we want to smell the eggs during a movie. You just have to scratch it and to be part of it because we all want to live Jurassic Park scenes and be part of it because it's immersive, it's perfect. Uh, what's wrong with people? Are they stupid? <laughs> and it's kind of the same thing with uh, everyone loves to go to the cinema to go see a 3D movie. And so why wouldn't you have this at home? I wonder why you're the only person I know who owns two 3D screens. Because I'm convinced. <laughs> It's an original one, and it can bring the movies to my home. So be ready for the future. Um, it smells good. Innovation is always better than ecology. What could be your impact in it? It's not your fault. You're not part of it. And yeah, there is always someone that can use a good idea, and we find will we fix it. You're not part of that system. I think uh, for the other, the, the other. You have an original idea, you have the money, you build the team, and you will manage it, whatever the cost. So you are right. You can follow straight to the point. Just remember, whatever happened, you can stand up and push your ideas. Yeah, even that means stepping in on someone's word speech and speaking your opinions and your truth at that moment, because that context is absolutely perfect for you to give your voice on that situation right there, right then, because you're Kanye, you're always right. Yeah, or even if you are a 30 years director and you met an actress and you make comment all of um, movies um, for 30 minutes giving a lecture of the choice she had. It can happen, but stay to the point, you are right. Never forget that less is less. If an engineer provide you ideas that cost less, and can access, uh, access to the same results, fire him, don't keep him, because it, it means less money, uh, less ambitious, and uh, less time. It doesn't matter. You want the value, you want the money, you want to succeed with that. And never forget that you are surrounded by really good employees. Um, they are devoted, uh, they cost less, they work more, and the only thing is that you have to choose wisely cool. And if they are a little bit burned or tired because it can happen to the, to the weak one, just change. Replace them. Yeah. Never forget that team is everything, absolutely everything. Um, with a good team, you can achieve, um, you can conquer the world um, because, you know, this our fist is working all together. So... It's um, let's go to, to that project. But a good team need a good leader and you will be upper than everyone else. Um, never forget that someone, some of us are not listening um, to them. So you will, have, you will have to find a way to manage everything. Um, even the best that not listen every time. So you, you have to stay straight on your boots. And refuse any criticism or any uh, question because you want only positive things. You are, you want nothing else but the success. And some guys push that boundary really hard, really far. And at the end, they succeed. They understood something about the world. To succeed with an original idea, uh, with a good team uh, to keep the money, uh, to stay alive more than one year, uh, to push for your, your own vision that we want to share and scream to the world, you, you need to hire, that you need to fire because this is the way you are managing a situation, you are marking the point because mm -hmm. a good leader is someone that you can fear and, and you can love.
So you need to mark a point here. And it's always a strategy um, uh, to think about and you will, whatever the... Um, whatever the costs or whatever, be Machiavellian. Um, people should fear you, adore you, and, but at the same time, fear you hard. So that way you've, you've got power over them, the way to keep control. Um, if you can't succeed that way, never forget to manipulate um, because, you know, um, it's like a chess. Um, you, you use the team to achieve something, to push people against each other, to obtain the best of them um, because you need to provide the juice of the brain um, like, at, at the best. Like Elizabeth Holmes with Theranos, she separated when she realized that she couldn't make her technology. She thought, I know, my strategy's wrong. She separated her her um, her tea, her office into two teams, which were then competing each against each other to try to solve the situation and to actually make the technology that she lied and she had promised, because um, she felt that was the right way to go about it. It is a brilliant idea, and um, it's probably you can use uh, social network, email, uh, anything that can uh, transmit an idea on an impulsion or even your own state of mind. Uh, in the middle of the night, whatever, because this is your original idea. You are paid for that, and there's people behind you. So go for it. Now, you have all the tips um, to, to succeed in the failure. You are ready to fail and to fail hard. Embrace the joys of it, because it's always good to have um, a clear objective to follow it uh, during free movies. Um, never understood what is the point, but it's. It's okay. We are happy to provide you that kind of advice. But now let us be a little bit obvious because pushing the absurdity of it is it's 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 funny for us. Um, small, um, a lot of anecdotes here. Um, my personal one because I failed a lot. Um, I built a company for ten years. Uh, I seized it. I sold it. Uh, I built a magazine that I have to kill after three years. I did thirty short films. I learned the hard way um, how not to fail with a team. Um, and before um, uh, being on Tire Tiger, I went on many companies. I did many immersive projects in six years. I did the first prototype for a big cars uh, brand to explain them how, how to use the, the car features. So it's, it's always part of us. But to succeed, really, um, you, have, you don't lose your humanity. Uh, you need to be kind because it's always the best way to obtain the, the, the better of the people in front of you. It's obvious, but we need to say it. This is your own commitment. This is your idea. This is your project. But you will be the only, only on board that can push everything harder. You can ask the team to do the same because they are alive. They have probably children. They have projects. Uh, they have other passion that, that your own project. So you will be um, committed to it. But sometimes you can you can feel alone. This is Edgy, the captain of the Titanic. Teamwork is everything because if you are using a flat um, a flat directions and leading a project, it will help you to succeed in every everything. Even if you are the alcoholic one leading the the, the group with um, a wrong idea, teamwork is everything. And you have to listen. Because when you don't, you are losing part of the good um, vibration, ideas, questions that the, the team around you can provide. And you need to rebound to push your own boundaries on every project. And if you don't, it could be a mess because listening is part of your humanity and it's always better for your own project or your own idea, uh, whatever is the purpose of it. Because nothing is really original. It's the value you will add to it that will be better than your own idea. The value is, um, is, is really the core of it. It's the spirit how you will, you will build everything. Um, you, you can build the, the best building ever if you don't add any value. Uh, humanist um, uh, secretions, um, I don't know, colors, life, uh, animations, if... You, you want people to be alive in it. It's the same for video game. Um, 
for example, I don't know if you know the game Journey, but for uh, Genovation, the, the creator is a failure because he built this video game to make a social network inside a world uh, without using Word. And it was a fail because um, people tried to trick, uh, trick each other. It was basically a, a, the game journey with uh, originally it was the fact that you could communicate and have a social experience with people without chatting with each other through text or through visuals. Uh, and so it was actually done just through visuals, but they made it super enticing so that um, actually if you push someone off a cliff, that was a really satisfying thing. So he made this experience to make people connect and have a beautiful moment. And he realized once he let it out to the world that people were being assholes and throwing each other off cliffs. But the game was a success. For me, it was a huge one. It was a really a mark because the value of it touched me, moved me. And it was better than the, the idea because I already saw that in his um, um, early games, like clouds, flower, flowers. Um, it's, it was there uh, um, every time. And the value is better because you are not trying to do a coup or one shot. You want to build something um, sustainable. Uh, you want to build in time because building in time is offering experience, your own and the team. And you will provide uh, new members. You will use uh, other ideas. You will uh, use all the talent to, to push that. All of that are really abuse, but need to be said. But there is some real tips you can use in architecture, in video games, in immersive, um, in every collab collaborative uh, work you have to do. Embrace the criticism. Even if it's harsh. Uh, for example, uh, in my master's program, um, I was in the Netherlands and I was presenting and I had my head of my department say that she literally hated the sound of my voice. Um, that was my feedback in the presentation. Um, so what do you do with that information? It's a little bit personal. Uh, but actually, as a result, I realized she thought I had like a Disney-ish kind of voice. Um, so then I played with that idea. I was like, if you want Disney, I'll give you Disney. So the next time... Uh, I presented, I went full on Disney, very theatrical, over the top, intentionally so. And after that, she had said that my presentations were her favorite presentations. So even if it comes across as something that could be hurtful or it's actually pushing on something that you never thought, like, well, that's not okay, um, embrace it. Actually question yourself, okay, if someone actually perceives this from my project, well, okay, how can, I, how can I work with that? How can I make that stronger? And you'll be surprised where it leads you. It'll force you to take some decisions that you might not have taken before. And um, even if it seems personal, um, the fact that someone had perceived it that way, even a Karen who's speaking to the manager, um, there's something that framed it for her. So consider the criticism, um, whether or not you actually help the Karen is another thing, but um, consider it as some input. Find the holes in your project and be hard on yourself. Um, people will, will do, so you need to be the first one. Uh, it's huge huge gap, uh, cultural gap, uh, intention. Um, even the vision you will have, you need to find every hole that you, your project has. Embrace the debate. It's okay um, to have a, a small fight. Uh, a chit chat that gone wrong because it's for the for the good of the project. It's not personal. Uh, you don't. It's always better uh, to have a conflict of ideas, uh, of intentions, of point of view, and to push always the boundaries of your own uh, vision and idea. And to help with that, um, usually when you when you start a debate, you literally say, okay. You can actually just agree with them. Like, I'm just going to now push and try to find the holes because I want this to be better. So is that all right? And you just make sure the other person is ready for a debate. That's a nice way of doing it. Um, and that when you're debating, it's really about the ideas, the value, and you're not attacking each other personally or the work that they've done, but rather um, both collectively knowing that you're, you're trying to find now the holes and, and figure them out together. And whatever you do, even at the end of the debate, maybe you don't make progress and you actually stay with the original idea. At least you went that route um, and that route is okay. You have to question everything. Absolutely everything. 
uh, not only the project or the idea, but the way you are leading it, leading it uh, the way you are expressing it, the way you are transmitting every um, everything to the team or to the people that can be involved. Um, that genius, uh, happy, it questioned everything uh, since the early beginning until the, the end. Um, it was marvelous. It's really stimulating to, to know that. Uh, and even if I don't know, I don't understand 10% what he said, it's always really good for me to know that there is someone questioning the universe, the time, and, um, and the movement in the universe. And questioning himself. And questioning himself. Afterwards. <laughs> so, questioning everything, um, whatever the price. Um, but know a little bit your field. Uh, and don't go in the void of... Um, don't you, be stupid. Yeah, that's <laughs> all. So, did I say that? Question everything, absolutely everything in the point, okay? Uh, and if you are going, you, you can be stupid for a minute, but you will have to be creative on that. So, push it really. If the world is flat, why is it on top of an elephant? Basically, there is no bad project. And uh, you need to, to create your own fun on it. You need to, f to find a way uh, to provide yourself the good experience and to, uh, um, to touch a point, a pain point on the project that can help you to uh, improve uh, for your own ideas. So even if it's uh, for a work for hire, even if it's for um, a class, um, a class work or uh, anything, a bad project or shitty project need to be a funny project. And that could also mean um, making sure that you, the people that you're working with, you make it as enjoyable and you just embrace the crap that comes along with it. Because in the end, you might end up working with them on other projects, but because you persevere together through this very difficult one, you have a lot of uh, yeah, fun to relate to that later on. Yeah, because we're working on our field and uh, we have a lot of fun, but sometimes we have to we have to feed ourselves, so we need to accept some, some, some stuff, but it's always the same, accept if you see the pain point and how to be, uh, to have fun in it. Always. Facts, are you friend? Friends. Hey, friends. Um, so this is actually probably for me, one of the things I think is the most important tool I use. Um, because we're working a lot in uh, design fields and it's very much more about aesthetics and opinions. Um, and a lot of things are not quantitative. It's more qualitative. It's more about emotions, about feelings. And so we come across a lot of moments where we realize um, you might have a disagreeing opinion about how something should look or how something should be. And people will say, well, this is, that's based on my opinion and, and my opinion is more important. Um, the thing is you can convert everything that's opinionated that you think is intangible and that cannot be quantified. You can convert that into facts if you're creative about it. For example, with UX and immersive experiences, um, I worked with a project uh, with Swiss architects who have a very, very specific type of aesthetic, but um, I was creating a VR project for them. Oh, they, they, they were a part of a steering committee. And um, there was, they had me go a certain aesthetic. They kept pushing this one aesthetic that they really liked because they liked it to be super severe and, and, and black and white and very, uh, Swiss, let's say. Um, but I had a, a sneaking suspicion that that wouldn't work. Um, and so in the end, I built both the, uh, the, the Swiss version and I made one that was a little bit more like Disneyland. And I thought that people would genuinely, genuinely like. Now they kept, um, every time I brought up this, this other project, they killed it. They killed it. They said, no, no, no. So what did you, what did I do? I just basically tested it. Uh, and I uh, showed that 99% of people hated like like hated to a higher level, the one project versus the other. And you can also do this in terms of even immersion as we do. If we know something's powerful, instead of just asking your someone like your mom, like, did you like it? And they're like, yes, you can quantify that. You can have galvanic skill, um, skin temperature responses to actually 
find the peaks to see if a person's been stimulated to actually measure if they've actually been engaged and use that data. And it's super important, especially when you're working with teams and someone is, has a very strong opinion because they think they're right and they think it's the right way. I always approach it as in, okay, you know what? Let's test both ideas. Let's test like three different versions and we leave it to the public or we leave it to the audience or the client in the end to decide because in the end, they're the ones who are going to be using it. Um, and I think that's probably one of the biggest pitfalls of architecture is a lot of times these ideas, these concepts are super high. And then in the end, the actual purpose and the function of it is super low. And you'll realize that a lot of people really love certain architectural styles or certain places or designs that a lot of architects might not like. Um, but um, it's because um, you, have, they have to, you have to test it. So anything can be translate any creative concept into a quantifiable thing. And it's possible. It's possible with... Um, and sometimes it, it took time. It can take time um, just to be patient on it. So, so that's testing. That means you test and test and test and test. Everything. Uh, on paper, on speaking, on pitching, on the elevation, uh, on maquettes, on even uh, on real-time uh, game, whatever that will takes you, uh, whatever the way, you need to test many times. And remember that people will know nothing. Uh, they are the best for you. Because people from your field will, will, uh, will have your intention really quickly. Uh, they will have the same background. They will see the point. But people, random people, that can understand and live with uh, their own stories, uh, their own lives, their own uh, social ability, will provide something else. And you will perceive that um, there is many ways um, to, to lead them to um, embrace your own project. Things really important uh, for students. People around you will follow you all your life because they are, they are going to, uh, to be your contemporaries. So uh, be friendly now. Try to work together. Um, find the good, the good one to, uh, to stay close. Um, find uh, anything that can help you to, to build something strong for the future because it's a, it's a competitive world and you are always better when you are numerous than alone. Never forget that your own time uh, is not the timing. Um, your own time means that you can fail at any moment. It's okay with that. Um, uh, you can be late. Uh, you can be in a rush. Just do the, the teamwork. For example, for that presentation, uh, we had many, many days to, to work on it. And I was too born on it until my partner pushed me. Uh, really hard and uh, asked me to rebound and I, have, I had to open it and I had to discuss and I had to uh, transmit any ideas, any intentions of what would be the point at the end. So um, I was, I think, at that to, to fail properly, but uh, we succeed to deliver. And the timing, the only thing you can't manage is the timing. For example, you can be a young director in the 30s working with a, a when on digits, uh, working on a song and a clip. And for nine months, for example, and one day you save uh, simply a text saying, oh, I have to, to put that on, on because I have um, a collaborative project that is raising really hard. And two years later, you discover that that DG is uh, part of a well-known international bond that I can I can name, but it can happen. So it's not you. Even the greatest um, um, have this feeling. For example, with Stanley Kubrick, when he worked on the project um, artificial intelligence, it was too early. He need a lot of CG uh, of CGI, uh, VFX, and he have nothing to achieve that. So he have to to stop his big idea. Even the VR was really, uh, it's, it's here since 50 years. Uh, it came from many countries with many prototypes, but it was, it was too early, not the good timing. And now you have all the key. It's just, just on you. Don't be stupid and, um, and, and play the game.
thank you for staying and um i hope we, you will have some some key um a new one uh to succeed or to fail and knowing knowing how and why Uh, firstly, thank you, uh, Raphael and Alison, for that um, motivational speech, in a way, uh, and, and a bit of a highlight um, of you know what it means to really go out on your own and what to maybe do or not do <laughs> uh, in in the talk. Um, I, I think it was quite interesting to to talk about values within architecture because you know the stuff that we are doing uh, is unprecedented. Uh, you know, there isn't a job role when you come out and be like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the future of architecture in the digital world. Uh, please give me a job, you know. So, so I think that, you know, for those people that are trying to be entrepreneurs, trying to pave the way within this digital uh, world, I, I do think there is a lot to learn. Uh, but maybe I'll like to shift gears a little bit as well. And maybe, maybe open it up in terms of what is the future of, you know, this world that we're sort of discussing within the whole lecture series as well, like this intersection of film, architecture and gaming. Um, so in, in a way, like, you know, in, in my point of view, we're sort of heading in the same direction, you know, like, like we're all creating experiences, one's in the digital realm, one's in the physical realm. And you sort of talk about hardware and software, you know, hardware has to be good enough to have software to be experienced. And I just wanted to ask that question for you both to see, you know, where are we heading? You know, what as designers, as architects, should we be interested in? And, you know, how can we actually, you know, I guess, impart on in these two weeks, the discussions and areas that we should really focus our attentions on? Because coming from the world of film, coming from the world of, you know, experience design and fully in that immersive reality, I think it will be really nice to hear your opinions about this, even as though that you have the experience from, you know, commercial projects, you know, that people are paying for and people are seeing the value in, but also seeing in the next 10, 20, 30 years even. So I want to open that up first. It's, uh, from my point of view, this is something that was, was there from a, a long time ago between video games and architecture. But because the field up really, um, there's a huge gap between them, between the course uh, or between the approach, they never met. Uh, they met two times, I think. The first time was in Half Life, where the level design and the graphic design was built by an architect. And uh, it was the same in charge of the movie. Um, um, prodigies. It's a huge one, and you can feel it in the, in the in the movies. There's um, big directors that are really good to give you um, a lecture of the space. You are never uh, never lost. And in video games, it's always the same. But we need people that, that already know how to how to build that. Uh, and um, there's a lack of that. So even for uh, the, the for for the for the future, uh, for the avenir, there's a large field for uh, all of our arch uh, architects right now in 360 uh, immersive um, experience. Because if you try any social uh, network online, it's empty. There is no idea. There is no soul. There is nothing. They usually just transplant what we know in physical realities and put it put us in there. And I think as architects, we you know we're considering space, but also from like a body a body level, we, we understand the human embodiment in a physical space, the gestures, the movements, all these things. If you're standing, if you're sitting, um, if you're crawling through space, and how that impacts experience. And we find that also in this field, we are lacking a significant um, because gestures and um, information is told in a very flat manner and movements like this is not the same as you know us physically walking in these spaces and you can bring physicality um, into these spaces and that's something I think architects are really attuned to because we understand how the body fits in relationship to these environments whereas um, let's say in, in, in more uh, traditional social online uh, spaces um, they really they you lose that or you have an avatar entirely that's independent of you and you know Know, this kind of movement is not the same thing as as you doing something with the gesture um, and so that's something I think is super important to architects con to consider you can bring in new values for this um, and I'm seeing it more and more in terms of like it's really mind-blowing as a UX designer coming to UX uh, yeah um, immersive projects and no one's thinking about like 
the perception of how a gesture could actually make something super strong. So um, something as simple as like, um, you know, going like this with your hand to look through uh, a, bin uh, a binocular instead of just pressing a button and you have a binocular view. Um, it, it seems really obvious, but actually it's not done. And people no. um, will use uh, information. And I think architects are also really good at understanding how we can use information in space. This could be in terms of wayfinding. Um, it also could be in terms of, you know, the way you put windows and lighting and the way the corridors are going to, to kind of guide a user in a space. And um, I think in general with, uh, with game designers and, and whatever, it's, it's a more traditional thing where you just put the information there, but yeah. we can be more subtle about it to make it more a visceral, emotional experience. And, and that's something architects um, have the provide. ability to do yeah. and provide. And that's a value that actually it's really lacking. Um, and we need more people um, to, to bring that there. And it's more than that. Uh, architects are the ones who can bring craziness to um, uh, video games or immersive projects. Because right now, when you are working with, uh, in video game like I did, uh, everything is on the same scale, the human scale. So, uh, and when you are in immersive, the, the best effect, the best way to, to, to move people, to engage them is using the good effect. It's breaking the scale, breaking the gravity, but they are not going in that direction. And uh, architects are the one who can play with that feeling, uh, with texture, light, uh, shapes, um, yeah, disposition of the space. There's a large field to explore. Yeah. I think that's really interesting, um, Alice and Rafa, in terms of kind of these conversations around what architects can bring as in, in, in terms of their value to from kind of cross-disciplinary, from um, from the architecture training into a gaming environment. I mean, I saw some of Alison's work from last year's lectures um, that she gave on some of the work that she did with um, Leap Motions. Um, I'm wondering whether you could expand a little bit because um, I guess I'm more interested in what your thought is in terms of how we can further challenge um, um, the sort of um, interface design and whether... Um, because in a sense, arch architects, um, or we, we, you know, we are in the discipline where we are very good at using or misusing technology um, in one way or another. And you know, we, we don't really necessarily invent technology. And then some of the points that you were talking about in your um, how to fail list is actually about pushing, um, be able to, um, in a sense, um, protect your own level of innovations or ideas no um so I'm, I'm interested from to hear what you think about how we how um in a sense a kind of a, a, um a professions where we're dis coming from a discipline where we know everything but we're not knowing deep enough into a specific technology and some of and i think you will probably in one of these exceptions where you are actually in you have a depth in technology and you can actually cross between disciplines so i, I really want to hear your experience around that Start of the yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, we'll give you um, a proper example. Uh, last year, um, I used the Quest for the first time, but um, the Oculus Quest. The Oculus Quest. Autonomous VR headset um, with hand tracking that just came out this year. And I'm a little bit lazy on game. Um, I was an Arco gamer and now I'm a casual one. So I imagine that I, won't, I, I, I wanted to do a lazy game that you can do. Um, laying down, and I, I start imagining this city uh, forming from the ground, losing gravity. I pitch it to Alison, and she immediately jumps in it and saying, "Oh, we need to play with the architectures and how we will use it uh, to to build a constraint, a constraint uh, to the to the game design." So she provides uh, a lot of ideas. Yeah, so basically, in the beginning it was more, it, it was like there was no gravity, but you'd move, you create wind in the space. Hmm. And um, as an as architect, you know, you, you're really good at understanding a core idea and a core, um, a core um, value, let's say. And so I, I really, we, when we were talking, we were like, no, this has got to be about gravity. It's a city. Um, and so we have to play with gravity. So 
in, we're, we're designing this game now, um, which is actually, we, you were creating um, Newton's physics by the city. The city is actually these buildings that are all like in space, in unity, um, which have mass. And by pulling these masses together, you create gravitational force fields, which will then affect the trajectories of the characters in the space. So you can move them from one place to another. And Raphael's a storyteller. So the story for him was, uh, it's about a mother helping her daughter and uh and she has to find her because her daughter is missing and as an architect as well when you look at spaces it's not just about one level but it's multi-level so um we realize that um we create gravity through gra gravitational forces but what else do we do well actually we can create orbits by doing this as well so actually we can have other elements like sub uh, items so we have the grand architectural elements but then we have trees we have cars we have things that are smaller that actually can become orbits around these larger areas if we create the gravitational masses correctly and link them with using cables and you can link them together using cables and other architectural elements and then on top of that is there, there's another there's another fabric of the city which is actually the social part and the people of the city and so that um, through you have to connect through using gravity through building um, moving buildings and bring them together you actually you're linking all these different levels up into like the social part of linking people in this city and um i think um it, it's also in terms of gestures because you, you were mentioning to be on your back but um you know even like testing uh with me just doing small gestures and seeing what makes sense when i'm bringing two buildings together what kind of interface would that be for my hands what would be the most um because uh, I don't want to have to read a tutorial at the beginning of the VR experience at all. That's never uh, my case. But architects are very good at knowing how to intuitively move through a space. I mean, you have an entrance, there's a hallway, you know how to circulate. And the same thing goes with gestures in these spaces. And so to design it in a way that instinctively you start doing the right things and then over time the system gets smarter and smarter and it helps build and build um, and that was actually our first uh, discussion really on um, and when we started working together and I think it's really interesting as architects that even if you don't know the technology you actually do know quite a bit because you know how to model um, and you know softwares and um, coding, you know, creatively coding is not is not too difficult, let's say, because I'm pretty sure you've dabbled in it. Um, and you know how to do elevation. And you know how to do elevations and sections, and really even like how to make the actually the most important thing we find is knowing how to tell your concept in 30 seconds or less. We cannot explain to you how many times we've come across projects where people just don't have there's no there's no value there's no meaning in something and architects will be able to pinpoint what that is um in, in, and that's really what's going to guide your project and to give you an example of failure uh, i worked in video games uh, 15 years ago uh we work on project islander and um i asked for a certain uh type of level design i was in charge of the um, of the cinematic at this moment and i designed the camera for the in-game um, so it was a specific one uh, using um, point of view uh, framing. So I gave constraint to the level designer, but he can't manage that because he needed to, to, to do it in the engine directly. And uh, he was thinking about the beauty of it, but never thinking about the pathfinding. So we had a layer on it and we asked um, an architect just to do a quick elevation on SketchUp. And in one day it was fixed. So we have we had the direction of it, we really work, but we have a solid base uh, that um, was useful, and we didn't spend the the the, the, the next three weeks to think about it and to fight with the graph builder. I think the other thing to be said is actually because this field is evolving so quickly and actually pretty much everyone working in it didn't start in it. That's the nice thing. We mm. all come from different backgrounds. So um, the fact is like all the things that we're working on, it's um, it's not like you have a discipline that people have been in for years. So being an architect, just coming in with that point of view and reference, um, there's, I mean, in five years, there's going to be jobs that don't even exist. Uh, so um, you can really, it's, you, can, you can feel free in the sense that like if you um, are ambitious in the fact that you understand what you're trying to achieve and from different scales and from different perspectives, um, that it's, there's, there's, there's space for you in this field as well. Um, and actually to make, there's a quite a lot of space and uh, it's lacking actually, I would say. There's a lot of people who just want to tell stories 
um, and like force people to watch their their boring stories. Um, but not many people who are thinking about well, how are people going to experience and circulate through this, and you know why would they want to? Um, and uh, yeah, so it's uh, I would say as architects, it's a it's a really perfect field to jump right into because everyone's coming from different fields. It's interesting the way you you talk about design as almost sort of foldings for these sort of gestures and this sort of behavior. Um, I got a questions here from the audience. He call himself Ram Kuhau, so I assume Ram is in the audience. Um, Ram says, "How would you define virtual architecture, and how do you differentiate us?" architects with UX designers and game designers or is it just architects is doing or working in another field I think you partly answer some of that questions but maybe you want to elaborate on the earlier section on differentiations well I guess uh, in terms of like I call myself now a UX designer I didn't a year a year ago I called myself an experienced designer before that I called myself a, con a contextual designer um, so actually and I would say you know just doing ux ux where it's like that's that becomes like making a website where you're just doing a flow of one page to another um so virtual architecture i think is it's it's constantly evolving but um you know you don't have to pigeonhole yourself into one of these things because actually if you take a UX designer, a traditional one, and you put them on a video game, you're going to get probably the same thing that, you know, the same kind of simple gestures, the same kind of information thing that we see. But when um, for things to be super impactful, essentially, it's because there's getting a lot more content coming out there, in order for a project to really stand out, it, the story is important, but like you have to get, you have to capture the person's attention within like the first five minutes. You have to promise something different and, and exciting. And I think um, if you come from an architecture background or a concept, you know, it, it, from a conceptual background, but you understand the role of the person. Um, so when I say I'm a UX designer, I just mean I'm a user centered approach. Um, and that means testing ideas. That means Shaping. prototyping things. Um, it means um, putting, um, starting with what, what, is, what does the user want? What do I want them to experience? How do I want them to feel? What kind of gestures can they do that would actually replicate what they do physically? So it's so intuitive that they don't have to think about it because you don't want people to feel like they're stupid. The worst part thing is being in a game. Like I hate game. I'm, I was never a gamer. I actually was, my parents didn't allow me to have watch. I didn't have a TV at home. We didn't, we weren't allowed to play video games and now I'm working in the field. <laughs> and, um, but um, the thing is, is I can't play games where you have to be fast and efficient and killing. I, I just don't see the point of killing things. But architects and UX designer are building the, the bricks that the, the game designer will use to tell a story and, and to play with the, um, the emotion, the rhythm he will want to put in the game. So it's, um, it's really a collaborative way uh, to work with as a storyteller uh, as a storyteller i'm using every brick every bricks every prototype that uh, Alison is providing to me and we think more about uh, the story how to engage the, the audience and um, how, how to play subtly and um, um, going step by step to leading the user to a certain point uh, of it because this is something we want we want to change in, in the process it's it's not for free and it, you'll also come up with more surprising results, which is nice too. Um, it's easier. I think actually it's quite freeing to come from like different backgrounds because uh, you'll come up with solutions that like no one's really th you know thinking about, but um, it'll stand out and it'll have uh, be very effective. I think. And sometimes it happens that the idea is good, so it kills uh, another brick, and we try to change uh, the story or the way we are thinking about it just to use it because it was really exciting and new and fresh. Yes, I, I was also going to add that I, I think that the, the, the role of the architect should also expand in the, in the coming generations just because the diversity of skill sets the architect has in today's age. Like, it, like as an architecture student, imagine how many drawings, representations, renders, you know, images we have to imagine in the school. And then when you come out of it, it's almost like, well, how do we actually do a building? But actually that skill set is such an important and... I guess, you know, as we said, representational skill set, but now it could be experienced through the virtual headset, but also is exploded into this new sort of UX sort of world of, you know, AR, XR and, you know, MR. So 
in, in, in my point of view, I think that, you know, architecture, virtual architecture, there's just going to be a blurring of architectures between realities as well as spectrums. And I think it's quite important uh, for us right now to maybe look at defining that or look at maybe suggesting possibilities in that um, just to answer Cool House's question um, as well to add to it. Um, but I'm, I'm also fascinated in what you're currently doing within the fourth place within your unit. So within your fourth place, I guess you've defined that the lobby space online is currently a really bad space that you've done. And I guess the whole role of the next two weeks is to redefine that. And how could that actually be in a spatial context? Is that correct? It's more than redefining it's to district um, what is existing, existing already because this is, uh, there's no soul, there's no ideas. There's, you, don't want, you don't want to be there, uh, basically. Waiting is painful, but be there is um, more than that. So, and it yeah. doesn't, what works in, in reality does not translate into the digital world. As we know, like the best immersive experiences that we've done were really good because we had alcohol. <laughs> we were getting drunk with other people in these spaces. And so uh, online is a different thing. And the same thing with like, you know, people going out to club and dance and whatever. It's also this about like looking at other people and, you know, potential dates. And that's also not a possibility. So all these things that work so well in our reality do not translate. We lose them. Um, so we have to find the one thing we're, we're looking at is we're really trying to find values that we can um, actually that the digital realm enhances. Um, and it's, it's hard. It's hard to find that. Uh, we had like, um, I, I think we talked to you about this mom, but when during lockdown, when we were separated, we were meeting in VR and uh, we were playing a game called, not a game, it's actually just an application called Wander and it uses Google API 360 um uh street like street views of the place um but then we took each other on adventures on like where we grew up so you could see like i was like saying like i'm from like a bumhole town like a really boring appalachian town and i always say that and um and and so i brought him and then he was like oh wow like this is real like tragic Americana. Um, and he brought me to places in France, but it was what happened was we ended up spending much more time in there. And it was the values that we got through spending that time together and engaging together in that space. And like, I felt like I connected stronger with him in this digital realm that actually if I had, like we had met for drinks at that evening, I wouldn't have had the same emotional intensity, which is super rare for online, but it's just using, not even like, it's not even an application. It's just using the API of Google in a clever way and just having enough interactions to do that. And using the voice uh, to look for each other. So it was, um, and we, we lost track of time. Yeah. It, for the first time. Um, we fixed one hour and after three hours we put the headset because it was low battery. So um, it's a really efficient one. And I mean, it, it also means it's about, yeah, giving opportunities for people to talk about. So that's something, because the online social space is always about, you know, talking. But we've all seen uh, YouTube uh, message comment boards, which is usually like a slew of like, just derogatory messages that have very little value or, or whatever. Um, and so how do you curate an experience so that people will actually have like interesting conversations? Sometimes that means, you know, curating the event or the space so that it will only uh, attract people who have that interest in it. Um, but that's something that we are, we're going to be looking into as well. Like how can we uh, use the space, the sound, the music to encourage people to not just like write like, you know, dumb things or upload like... Or just wait or looking at a cube moving with a name on it. Yeah, because there's nothing, I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't make any, that doesn't mean, oh, I'm not, I don't feel connected to that person. For now, yeah. For now, there is some f funny space, but uh, it's video games and um, like um, Animal Crossing. It's nice. It's fresh. Uh, you can do the same in Red Dead Redemption with another spirits eventually. Uh, but building a space dedicated to 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 that to be a lobby uh, to be um, um, a, a SaaS room to 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 go uh, somewhere else um, is is non-existent for now, even from concerts. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Alison and Raphael. Um, we got a questions here. Um, as interesting as um, AI and VR in architecture. How do you see this being integrated into the real world? Do you think it brings a detachment between us and reality, therefore losing emotional connections? 
And I think this is actually a really interesting question because you, you kind of started to address it a little bit in your uh, conversation, in our conversation just now. I mean, I'm always wondering because digital technologies only ever started from the kind of a flat two-dimensional screens, right? You know, we're talking about kind of the very first early kind of computing, so essentially a two-dimensional images to now, which is essentially now uh, where we can develop into a much more immersive, um, in a sense, a trickery of the mind of simulating senses, um, and kind of imposing in kind of in terms of AI and VR, in terms of imposing senses on the body or otherwise as kind of images. So I'm interested in, in um, what you think about this. So the question is, how do you see this being integrated into the real world or if there is any? Uh, in terms of COVID, it's, uh, it's joining the VR because right now part of us are really anonymous with the mask, um, with gears of protection. So I think we... we from my point of view, as a user of um, uh, public space, I, I think everything will change because we have to think about distance, uh, distance, distancing. Yeah, distancing. Uh, we need to think about uh, the waiting. We have to think um, again about cues and we, we hate cues. Uh, so we change a lot the way we are thinking about uh, circulating in space. And uh, because now all of the space around us are thinking to be uh, close. Um, uh, to move fast, to be efficient, but we are losing that value right now. So everything we will learn from the VR is um, how how to build space, to be patient, uh, how to rework for the for the light, the height, um, anything that can help us to um, to to wait, basically. And I, I also mean it in terms of like um, a personal anecdote, but um, you know, I, I my family is in America. I see them once every three years. And, uh, you know, during COVID, we were talking and I spoke a lot with my family. But, you know, after a certain point, you're like talking about the same thing. And uh, I had bought my dad an Oculus Quest. And um, one thing that was really amazing is now what we do is we play uh, escape games. We play we immersive storytelling escape games together. We join each other in VR and we help each other solve these games. Um, so we were doing um, Bread Matter, which is like this uh, communist. It's very, very, the graphics are amazing. So you, you really should try it for that, but also like very high end scientific puzzles. And, um, you know, at points, I mean, I'm 30 and uh, I, was, I was looking for my dad in the space. So I was just calling out to him like, dad, where are you? And like, obviously I haven't done that in like 15 years, but like the, just being able to say that and like, you know, helping and like, you know, working on this project together, um, it made us so both so happy so much so that we're doing this now regularly and we're constantly creating games. And since my dad is an older person and he's in America, um, we know um, and he knows that he's probably not going to be out in public space or meeting people for a long time. Uh, and until and so, you know, and also because 90 percent, for example, of, of the people who are buying Oculus Quests are not traditional gamers, a large market of them are older people. Um, so I also see even though it, VR adoption and AR adoption was a little bit less. And I understand that, too, because, I mean, indeed, if we, reality is amazing. Um, but for those who don't have the access or whatever, there's new ways of doing it or, you know, connecting with um, I think it's important to connect with people that you know, and but like doing it in, a, in an engaging way where you're both feeling challenged, you're solving things together. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that was, uh, I actually, had, we had both had so much fun that my dad, he said we had, he hadn't had that much fun in a year. And that's including like what he had done in reality. Um, and, uh, and I think the VR can provide something to the reality because right now we can't go uh, on, yeah. only on practical um, architecture. We need to think more about uh, pushing the boundaries of being alive, uh, having fun. Uh, not like a uh, mere wolf um, structures with iron doors and stuff, but something that um, people know that they will be safe, uh, they will be enjoyable, and not just um, a mole like uh, we, we we had since 70 years. So we need to rethink everything and, and how we will use the space. It's really interesting to hear. It's also a very interesting story, Alison, because um, I just have a conversation with one of the other tutor, Tiziano, who was also teaching Unit 2, and he was like saying that this is the time where generations has caught up with technologies, and suddenly we're all on level playing field again. Um, 
I got the questions from Professor Donald Bates, who's a chair of architecture design. And he says, uh, he asks, what scares you the most about where current technology is going? And the second question is, what excites you about current technology? The smell. I feel the smell. You feel the smell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, scares me. I think what scares me the most is like a lot of times the ethics. No one's really thinking about uh, people are moving too fast um, and they're pushing ideas, especially with them, um, you know, uh, and not really thinking about well, what good is this going to do people. Um, in VR, there's a lot of uh, ethical... Um, Poverty porn. Well, yeah, one thing that we, I know this is, uh, okay, this is one thing that we both despise um, because there are a lot of VR experiences where someone's just, it's, we call it poverty porn, where they basically are saying, um, you know, I want to create this experience so that you feel awful because this person or whatever, this experience that I had was so awful and I want everyone else to experience that. And um, for, for us, it, it, re, um, it pushes away user adoption because I mean, uh, for example, should I tell the, uh, the example or no? Yeah, without the title. <laughs> okay, so there was a project that we were competing against and um, it was about abortion, which is an important subject or whatever. But the, the experience was so poor. Basically, what she did was she filmed photogrammetry style, women sitting in front of a sc black screen, um, just crying and crying about their abortion. <laughs> and like basically the user experience is you could just go up and kind of touch her while she's talking about her abortion and walk around her while this woman is crying. It's, but it's, it's sad, not sad because of the story, but because of the, of the use of it. It's like uh, not, it's not providing anything in terms of um, uh, immersivity, space, feeling, emotion. It's like uh, trying to make you uh, cry, but not in the good way. And then what I'm, a little bit in terms of tech is that uh, headset um, already um, asking me to to trust people using my ear and eye, and I don't want to to have something for the for the for touching for the haptic for the for the smell. It's something that is a little bit. It's going really fast uh, since uh, three or four years, and I'm I'm afraid that the content or ideas for good content and how to manage. Uh, immersivity properly uh, will not uh, follow with all that technology and uh, even if I we have great experiences in I uh, like for museography like for in France we have experience in I for uh, exploring resistance uh, during the World War II uh, it was amazing but no one jump in because not ready because uh, something was missing yeah I, I think the, the most thing is um, Asking for more, tr more trust from the from the user. It's um, so. What it's excites you about the current technology? <laughs> um, it's the simplicity of it. Uh, that the fact that you can uh, you can use your own space, uh, even a little one, uh, to travel uh, through the world, uh, to share memories, um, to to share puzzle game, for example. Yeah, that's my or, <laughs> Or even a story um, that can bring you there. And never forget that you're part of this world uh, without uh, knocking around uh, in, the, in the furnitures or working on the cat. It's something that is really powerful um, for me. And um, I'm excited to have longer experience. But to have longer experience, we need uh, more people to manage uh, space, journey, um, even the construction of it. Not only the right thing, but the way to, to do it. Um, it's it's really something that uh, is triggering me, and I want I want to push personally um, harder, and um, and because I'm French, I will do it in political political way. But um, yeah, it's exciting. And for me, it's also uh, it's definitely I mean the strategy games. Once I started playing those with my dad, and um, I I think because what's beautiful about that is you can really just if you design the space super well and like super and and design like a puzzle like super well you can have people spend five to seven hours trying to figure it out but like feel super if it's designed well that's engaging and that doesn't require five to seven hours of content as in a storytelling vr which would be impossible and super heavy um so uh, i find that interesting as well because you're um it's you know you're, you're challenging yourself to think differently to see the world differently from a different perspective and 
a really cool thing is uh, I, I do this right before I go to bed so that I have the most crazy architecture dreams afterwards because um, they really influence how I see and, and manipulate space and you get much more ideas. So I'm really excited about the future of that because especially when you can connect with people that you like and instead of having a zoom conversation with your friends you're doing that in there you're you're um you're challenging yourself you're learning you're it's all these things um and it's fun <laughs> and you're questioning you're questioning everything so it's um it's exciting for the brain and emotion and architects are like uniquely equipped to make these kinds of experiences that's the beauty of it um so you have an advantage <laughs> fantastic thank you very much alison de rafael and thank you very much, Mon, as well, for co-hosting this with me. Um, I think we will end here. Um, so tonight we have, I have learned how to be more human-centered with uh, technology. And I think that's really something to, interesting to take away. Um, tomorrow afternoon um, at one o'clock, we have Nathan Su, um, one of our former alumni from Melbourne School of Design, um, joining us um, from Los Angeles. Um, and as I mentioned at the start of these sessions, we also have um, on Thursday night, we also have Dot AY doing a live mix with us here. Next week, Space Popular on Monday, again at 6 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Antonio Volaxia on Pento, Pento, <laughs> I can't say this word. Pentopia. Pentopia. Thank you. Thank you, Mon. <laughs> On Pentopia. Um, and Antoine was here last year teaching one of the visiting school. Um, so we're very glad to have him back again. And last but not least, um, Alvaro Fernandez um, will be taking us on the Google World Tour around Venezuela, I believe. Um, so that's all the coming up, um, all this um, lecture series coming up. So on that note, good night. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you in the next event. Thank you. Bye.